So, continuing. Um, this is actually um, not part of the book yet, but I will make it a chapter. I'm making a chapter on hypnosis. Um, to really understand how neuroweapons uh, work um, physiologically, biologically, within our, our brains, um, it's important to understand that hypnosis is the basis of neuroweapons. Um, the early uh, researchers like uh, Vasilov uh, in the Soviet Union, um, uh, Kaczynski, um, they were all interested, Bekhtarev, <laughs> everybody was interested in, in using hypnosis to study telepathy. Uh, Hypnosis and telepathy are intertwined in this research, and you'll see this going all the way back to the late 19th century, and even the research of uh, uh, a German named Tischner who was researching hypnosis and telepathy uh, before um, Kaczynski and the Soviets and uh, other German researchers. Um, hypnosis, we all know of hypnosis, um, like if you want to quit smoking, um, you could get hypnotized. Hypnosis is used to change behaviors. So it's very easy to see why they would be studying hypnosis and remote influencing and or telepathy, what we call telepathy, which is just remote uh, suggestion, remotely influencing someone to do something. How hypnosis works is um, basically they're putting you in a trance state. In the trance state, you're easily uh, suggestible. You're, you're being put into a state where your mind will easily take suggestions from someone else and follow those directions. How this works is that in the brain, they have uh, these different networks. Like there's an executive control network, uh, a silencing network, and a default module network. So what we get out of these uh, interactions in hypnosis is different uh, levels go down and different levels go up. There is a differentiation between humans, between highly hypnotizable people, moderately hypnotizable people, which I am, and low to non-hypnotizable people, but some people just can't be hypnotized. Um, and there's physical reasons for this. It's all about genetics and your DNA. Um, you know, the typical things. It's not really a cultural thing because you can hypnotize anybody in any culture, in any tribe, anywhere, in any nation. So, uh, one of the things about these highly hypnotizables and medium hypnotizables and low hypnotizables is there is a physical differentiation. But first, uh, we want to look at the population um, dispersion amongst highly hypnotizables. In any given population across the world, there are 30 to 35 percent of the population is highly hypnotizable. This is a one third of the population that can be hypnotized very deeply, and they will do whatever you say. Then there are medium, moderately hypnotizable people, and that comprises anywhere from 55 to 60 percent of the population. Like the vast majority are are moderately hypnotizable. Then there is this 10 percent which are either non-hypnotizable or very lowly hypnotizable, like they hardly respond to hypnosis at all. Um, what the physical difference between highly hypnotizables and the rest of the people, it's only differentiated physically in what they have identified as highly hypnotizable people. The moderately hypnotizables and the non-hypnotizables do not have any physiological differences between them. It is only the highly hypnotizables that have physiological differences. One of those differences is in the corpus callosum, there's an enlarged rostrum. Now, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, but I'm going to attempt to show it to you. Whoops. Right here is the rostrum, and that is enlarged in highly hypnotizables.
Um, some other differences between highly hypnotizables and the rest of us is that a highly hypnotizable person, their brain patterns when are more imaginative. Or they, they engage the visual cortex more. Whereas others engage more cognitive patterns, they're thinking more, they're uh, more self-willed and, and in a certain sense they're not engaging the visual cortex as much. Um, one of the things we're going to get to over here is the role of uh, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is written about by John Norsing as well. Um, in his research in thought injection. Um, what over here is that there is this combination between uh, in neural weapons, the amygdala, the amygdala is a part of our brain which processes fear and anxiety, but it is a very ancient part of the brain. This is more like, this is um, one of our uh, very uh, primordial ancient, you know, it, it far supersedes being in our brain before we, were, we ever took on a human art form. Um, it's like one of the most base, uh, base things about the brain, I guess you could say. What happens in, in neuroweapons, it's not directly related to hypnosis, but indirectly, is in neuroweapons they have found that you can trigger the amygdala to override, to automatically override uh, actions. They are, have found a way, this, this is called a fast reflexive control. Um, they found a way to trigger the amygdala to override things and uh, get your fear responses up. The interesting part in its relationship to the, to the anterior cingulate cortex is that they're both based on fear and pain. And also the, the ACC is controlling your willpower, your, your will to uh, survive on your own, your will to think for yourself. As the activation in the ACC goes down, one's willpower goes down, one's ability to um, desire to keep going, desire to think for themselves, etc. Now, going back to this executive control network, the silency network, the silency network gives us uh, contextual information, is it salient? Uh, and the default mode network. In highly hypnotizable people, when they go into hypnosis, their default mode network goes down, their silencing network goes up, as, and the executive control network goes up. But there's a, there's a clear differentiation between the default mode network and the executive control network. Now, in, the, in highs, in the silency network, which is related to the anterior cingulate cortex, as the, the frequency amplification of the ACC goes down, but this is only in highs. It's another one of those, uh, only highs show differentiation from the rest of the population. Uh, another thing that happens in highs is the connectivity between uh, what's known as the DLPFC and the insula. And what the insula does is give us self-images, is there's an increased connectivity between these, the DLPFC and the insula. While at the same time in the prefrontal um, cingulate cortex, the DLPFC connectivity with the PCC goes down. Uh, one, one of the other differentiations they've shown between highly hypnotizables and the rest of uh, people is that the processing speed, specifically of the, uh, uh, the ACC, will, is a much faster, it's at like one, uh, one, one thousandth of a millisecond, I think it is, whereas the rest of us is like slower. And this processing speed might have something to do with why they're able to go into such deep uh, hypnosis, but, um, Researchers are always looking into these issues and doing more research. But it's important to understand that hypnosis is the basis of neural weapons and that a third of our population has a different brain structure, different brain um, 
not necessarily function, but there are large parts of the brain that cause someone to be um, highly hypnotizable and there are other physiological differentiations. And a third of the population is highly hypnotizable of any society.